Hey guys, I'm Philip Molina, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 2, Home. And yeah, we can breathe again. Jon Snow lives. And of course, we all thought this was going to happen. But remember, this is Game of Thrones. Sometimes they hate us and never want us to be happy. So we got to win. Yay. I'm going to break everything down, point out some differences from the books, and also just maybe some things you might have missed on your first viewing. Also, if you're new to these breakdowns, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm a huge Game of Thrones nerd. I've read the books, love the show. And these breakdowns, treat them like a podcast of things that I I find interesting about a Game of Thrones episode. I try to find the hidden meaning in things a lot of times. A lot of times I think the writers are purposely putting these things in there to see if anyone picks up on them. Sometimes maybe they're not doing that, but I'm still gonna point it out if I personally find it interesting. So anyway, let's dive in with the opening images. So we pick up where we left Bran at the end of season four in the cave of the three-eyed raven beyond the wall. And small difference in the books, it's actually the three-eyed crow, not raven. But this role is now being played by Max Von it out, who you might remember as Lore Santeca from The Force Awakens, and that's another time he plays an old guy that we don't know crap about. The Three-Eyed Raven is this voice that's been reaching out to Bran since season one, but here's the thing. He might have a total, complete backstory that we do know from the books. It's not 100% definite that this is the exact same version of the Three-Eyed Raven slash Three-Eyed Crow from the books, but I also heard they might not go into his backstory on the show. So, just just in case they're not gonna do it on the show. I'm gonna tell you that backstory, but uh, if they do end up doing it on the show, it could end up being spoilers. So go ahead and jump to this time if you don't wanna know anything about the Three-Eyed Raven slash Three-Eyed Crow. All right, ready? Let's go. Okay, and remember, they might not be doing this version on the show. This could be a different guy, but if it's the same guy, then the Three-Eyed Raven's name actually used to be Brendan Rivers. And Rivers is one of those bastard last names, uh, like snow, stone, sand, and flowers, except he's not just like any old dirty bastard. He's one of the bastard sons of King Aegon Targaryen IV. Later, when various Targaryen heirs actually fight against each other in a civil war called the the, uh, Blackfire Rebellion, but it's a hundred years before the events of Game of Thrones. Brendan Rivers then uh, served as Hand of the King to King Aerys the First and Makar the First. Makar's the great grandfather of Aerys the Second, the Mad King Aerys that you've heard of. So when Brendan's side loses the war, he gets sent to the Wall to accompany his cousin Aemon Targaryen, who's that old blind maester who died pretty recently. While at the Wall, Brendan Rivers actually rose to the rank of Lord Commander, but then he went out on one of these ranging trips and he disappeared in the forest and it's pretty much exactly what happened to Jon Snow's uncle, Benjen Stark. He just goes missing. Brendan was known for using sorcery and black magic, including his abilities as a warg and as a green seer, which are not the same thing. It's hard to kind of remember these uh, weird words. A warg is someone who controls the minds of animals and a green seer is someone whose dreams show the future. So uh, he now lives under this great weirwood tree and his body body's all like tangled up in these roots and God knows how he eats or uses the bathroom or anything. He's easily over a hundred years old. Again, I'm not hundred percent sure that on the show they're gonna make it exactly the same guy on the show. They might be like, he's thousands of years old or something. He's a totally different guy. Uh, it's not clear for sure, but this version is Brendan Rivers, probably like 115 years old, but maybe older than that. Either way, he's probably too young for the Red Woman. Now here's a question some of you asked me. Uh, you know that Bran and the Three-Eyed Raven can see through animals and maybe they can see the future, but how do they see into the past events that they weren't there for? Are they warging into something right now? So I think these opening images are focusing on the roots of the weirwood tree to give us a clue as to how these visions are taking place. Weirwoods are these old sacred trees that have been around for thousands of years. Technically they can live forever if they're undisturbed. Weirwoods are considered sacred to the followers of the old gods and the children of the forest, they believe weirwoods are the gods. So some green seed can see through the eyes of a weirwood tree through its carved face and this is getting weird I know but because trees have no sense of time they can't tell where they exist in time the green seer looking through the eyes of the tree is actually able to see into the past or the present or the future when looking through a tree's eyes it's said that through the faces of these trees that's how the old gods watch over everyone and bear witness to really important events that's also why you want to hide from these trees if you're gonna do anything terrible anyway one of these weirwood memories uh, gives us our 
opening images for this episode, Bran seeing a vision of young Ned Stark in Winterfell with his brother Benjen, and that's the uncle that we mentioned before who Jon Snow followed into the Night's Watch and is still currently missing, actually. Ned tells Benjen, Keep your shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. You might not remember, but we heard Jon Snow say that exact same line to Ollie at the beginning of last season. Keep your shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. So this is something Ned probably passed down to all of his sons. One big takeaway here is how happy Winterfell looks. Bran even says it. They were all so happy. It's like a freaking sepia Instagram filter. The colors are warmer. We see the white Stark banners are hanging. It's like night and day from the Winterfell of today right now with its gloomy blue colors and the grim Bolton flayed man <laughs> sigil everywhere. Remember, it's winter in the present day and this flashback looks a lot like the kind of summery days of season one. Shout out to film colorists who can tell part of a story just by tweaking the colors. But this happy version of Winterfell no longer exists and this vision is setting us up for this theme of home as a false sanctuary. We'll get back to that shortly. All these people though, they're gone or dead. Mutton Chops here is a young Roger Cassell, the master of arms who Theon beheaded, but he also trained the Stark children that we know, so now we see he also trained Ned and his brothers. We have Old Nan just being Nan. One of the few survivors of this time is Hodor, who we now know is Willis, and apparently he used to say things other than Hodor. And lowers it when he's going to dodge my lady. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's a difference from the books though. There, his real name is Walder, not Willis. But I guess they didn't want people to confuse him with the many different people that are named Walder Frey. In the books, Walder names like most of his kids Walder too. So they changed it to Willis on the show. By the way, I have a feeling that we're gonna get a lot more of Willis's story and what happened to his freaking brain in another one of these flashbacks. I think there's gonna be a lot of these flashbacks actually. We also see a young young Lyanna Stark and it's her first live appearance on the show. And this like show off -y entrance, it's almost directly in parallel to the way Arya showed up her little brother in the first episode. Ned Stark would often say how much Arya reminded him of his sister Lyanna and this is kind of proof of that wild spirit that they share. Lyanna is clearly an important figure from the past and the show wants us to remember, especially considering that next episode is going to show us the infamous Tower of Joy event, which has to do with her dying. Uh, the Tower of Joy is this brutal fight that came at the end of Robert's Rebellion back in the day. And it's really tied up in this Jon Snow true parentage theory that I went over in the last breakdown. I'll watch that if you want more details on that theory. But focusing on the battle, it's Ned Stark and a gang of badasses fighting against three other knights. One of them is Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, who's just one of the greatest knights in the history of Westeros. People always talk about this knight and how he's the guy that all knights are graded against. So that battle ends with a dying Lyanna asking for a promise from Ned, probably about Jon Snow. So this scene here with this flashback, it's all set up in preparation for this storyline that we're getting exposed to from the past uh, very slowly. And we're gonna see again more of it in the next episode with the Tower of Joy. I'm so pumped for that battle and fight. It's supposed to be an amazing fight, so I'm really excited. Before I move on, I wanna mention something else about Lyanna. She's got a lot of similarities to the Celtic god Rhiannon. And just like a theory about Lyanna, Rhiannon escaped from an arranged marriage and had a baby with another man and that baby's identity was a big old secret for a really long time and Rhiannon was famous for riding on a white horse that looks a lot like this one just saying after they leave the flashback the three-eyed raven warns Bran it is beautiful beneath the sea but if you stay too long you'll drown and Bran replies I wasn't drowning I was home. Home is the title of this episode, and this moment sets up that important thematic through line. Homes are meant to be left behind. Like a baby bird, you have to leave the nest eventually so you can grow and change. But if you stay too long, a home can become a false sanctuary that traps you there until you die. That false sanctuary idea, along with the concept of drowning, those both come up a lot in this episode. So I'll point those out as we come across them. And real quick, this child of the forest that looks a little funky, this is actually the same character Lee uh, they just redesigned her look. It's new, different, cool, <laughs> moving on. Remember how last episode I pointed out that Davos was able to tell that Thorne is just a big old liar and he was gonna kill everyone in that room if he has his way? That's being confirmed right here with all these archers and people holding crossbows as Thorne is still all like, yeah, come on out, it's fine. We're, we're having a party out here actually. These kinds of lies, they play a huge role in all of the events of Game of Thrones, but I will be getting into that later. Luckily, this is the episode where mostly good things happen, so we get to 
see the Wildling Giant 1-1 toss around a Night's Watch Archer like Hulk did to Loki in the Avengers. And while we don't see Thorn or Ollie die yet, uh, which is a little bit of a bummer, but I think they will, there's some poetic justice in the way that things go down for them. Because their greatest fear was that Castle Black would fall to the Wildling. So they kill Jon Snow to stop that from happening. And then what happens? Castle Black falls to the Wildling. So Thorn and Ollie's own stupid plotting brought about their greatest fear. Good job, guys. Probably gonna die. <laughs> we leave the wall with a shot of Jon's corpse, and the framing of this shot makes it look like his Valerian steel sword is kind of sticking out of his chest. It's almost like Davos is trying to pull the sword out of him, like he's trying to reverse all the stabbings that killed Jon. But look at the way the sword is purposely angled to reflect the light, almost like a prophesied glowing sword that is held by a prophesied prince that was promised. All of this is done purposely. P P P P P. <laughs> Uh, I'll talk about it later though. It's always interesting when Game of Thrones gives us the perspective of an like unimportant street level commoner like this drunk that's bragging about having Flash Cersei during her walk of shame. These regular people don't take this story as seriously as all of us do. So it's kind of funny to hear them laugh through these details. But Game of Thrones quickly reminds us that this story isn't about those people. It's about the people at the top and the freak show that surrounds them. Case in point, Sir Gregor Clegane reanimated. In the books, he's become Sir Robert Strong. I don't think they're called calling him that on the show. I, ca I can't tell, I don't remember honestly. I think it's just Sir Gregor still, but either way, it's 15 minutes in and we have seen two giants turn men into just bloody smears. The really good thing Old Nan stepped in before Hodor did the same thing to little baby Benjen. More and more fantastical elements are coming into this world, giants and dragons and resurrected corpses, and it's kind of like the reign of ordinary men is coming to an end. And at the end, I'm gonna explain why I think that's happening. But moving on. Cersei pulling the loose thread from her morning gown is a symbol for how her formerly regal life and power, it's all unraveling. It's hard to feel like you're in control and very queen-like when you can't do anything to prevent your kids from dying. Her fancy clothing, which just represents her status as a queen regent, it can't do anything about this witch's prophecy and adding to her power coming undone, Tommen has just ordered the king's guard to trap her inside her home, which is another case of a home becoming a false sanctuary. It's actually more like a cage. And then Jamie's father-son moment with the Tommen and the Sept, it kind of reminds us actually about the Kingslayer just not having really any respect for these sacred institutions. Because remember the last time that he was here, he had that awkward kind of forced uh, sex with Cersei next to their son's dead body. And this time he threatens to spill the blood of the Westeros equivalent to the Pope. So Jamie is another example of one of these ordinary men that spits in the face of the gods and breaks his vows, but that's part of that thing I'm going to explain at the end. The High Sparrow then explains that the eye stones are supposed to teach us not to fear death because our eyes close in one life and they open in the next. That runs parallel to Bran's situation where he closed his eyes in season one and it marked the death of his childhood, but he opens his eyes now to a new life as a warrior and as a green seer. Then in Marine, we get this shot of the harpy statue that used to be at the top of the pyramid before it was torn down at the beginning of last season. But what exactly does that statue you mean. Keep in mind the harpy is the symbol of the old Giscari empire, I think, of Essos. It's just like the dragon is the symbol for House Targaryen. So harpy statues had appeared in the city that Danny had conquered. And if you notice, harpy statues have chains and iron collars in their talons, which represent the slavery tradition that Danny has now overthrown. But now we see that the statue literally didn't go anywhere. It's been sitting there this whole time, just lingering in the shadows, and that represents the that this concept of slavery and that tradition, it also didn't go anywhere. It's sitting there, it's remnants at least, in the people of Marine, just kind of in the shadows. Tyrion then gives his new small council a lecture about dragons in captivity suffering stunted growth and dying, and it's based on what he's read in the book Aegon's Dragons. It's kind of like also what supposedly happens to kittens that were raised in jars. It's not a real thing, but they're called bonsai kittens. Look it up, it's hilariously adorable. But more importantly, kind of like Bran and Cersei, that's another example of how a home that's been created, like this cave for these dragons, can actually become a false sanctuary. If you stay too long, it's more like you're imprisoned there and it'll eventually kill you. And even though he's just referring to the Targaryen's dragons, his lesson also applies to the Targaryens themselves. One of Danny's shortcomings as a ruler of Marine was her tendency to stay shut away inside of her pyramid or her safe haven, away from her people, so they kind of stopped trusting her. That's not too different from her 
her father, the Mad King Eris, who spent his final days holed up in the Red Keep, burning people alive until, you know, Jaime Lannister killed him. Both the Targaryens and their dragons need to leave their false sanctuaries. And while Daenerys has done that in a way, we'll get to that soon, but Tyrion unchaining these dragons in the dungeon, it kind of points something interesting out. He's pretty much ruling Marine right now, and he's using all his wisdom from Westeros, and it's making him a pretty good ruler. Like, no offense to Danny, but she's the mother of dragons and the breaker of chains, and she's the one that chained them up. In a way, Tyrion now is the new breaker of chains, at least in this moment. And Tyrion's childhood fascination with dragons, that raises the question, why are the dragons so friendly to Tyrion? A lot of you are asking me about another theory that could be a spoiler, so heads up skip to this time. It's possible that Tyrion is actually the bastard son of the Mad King Aerys Targaryen and Tywin Lannister's wife Joanna. That would give another reason why Tywin so frequently declared, You're no son of mine. It would also make Tyrion brother to Daenerys, and if that theory about Jon Snow is true, it would make him Jon Snow's uncle. And it would make sense why dragons don't hate him, because he's part Targaryen. And if you remember when Danny, way back when, went into the House of the Undying and she saw all these like images and they were kind of like prophecies, in the books, she sees way more when she's there. She looks into a room, see a man with silver hair and he's holding a newborn, and he's talking about a three-headed dragon. So silver-haired people tend to be Targaryen, Targaryens, and the book is full of references to this moment where the Targaryen dragon is said to need three heads, as in three leaders. Some people take that to mean that there are three young Targaryen people out there left in the world, and that could correspond to our three main protagonists of this series. Daenerys, Jon Snow, if that theory is true, and Tyrion, this theory is true. And Tyrion did hit it off with both Danny and Jon almost immediately, and then he walks into a dungeon with two vicious dragons and he comes out completely unscathed, which definitely makes this Tyrion Targaryen theory pretty plausible. There's another reason why all three of these characters are sort of linked and why it feels like it could be headed toward a situation where Jon and Daenerys co-rule Westeros with Tyrion serving as a hand to the king and queen them. But I will get to this other connection that they have at the end. Let's move on. Arya faces one last test before Jack and Hagar takes her back in. If a girl says her name, the man will let her sleep under the roof tonight. A promise of shelter or home, but Arya knows that this roof to sleep under is just another false sanctuary in this backwards world where homes are not safe places and weddings are red. She knows better and remains true to having no name, and by leaving her home behind her, she can now move forward. The next scene shows us Winterfell, another home that would have meant death if the residents had stayed, and obviously it does mean that for Roos Bolton now. One interesting thing to point out here, Ramsay's betrayal comes in the form of a hug and a stab, just like how Roos's betrayal of Rob Stark came with a hug and a stab too. Now, if a hug seems like a weird choice for Ramsay in the first place, it does kind of make sense actually because there's another little missable moment here. Ramsay knows he has to kill his father as soon as possible, but his father is famous for wearing protective chainmail almost all the time. So this hug gives Ramsay a chance to check and see if Roos was wearing his famous chainmail. And once he'd confirmed that he's not, he knew now was the time to make his move. Also, when the former Lord Bolton references Ramsay acting like a mad dog as if it's a bad thing, he clearly doesn't get Ramsay because a moment later, Ramsay makes it very clear. If he had to choose between being like a mad dog or being this noble, true son of House Bolton, well, he's gonna pick mad dogs because pitted against each other, mad dogs beat noble babies every time. And I know if you're thinking that's an unfair fight, mad dogs and babies, I, it's more the representation of true noble birth and innocence and not willing to do what it takes like a mad dog is willing to do what it takes. So I do mean, yes, literally, uh, dogs beat babies in fights, but I also mean figuratively. <laughs> Ramsey's like, yeah, I'll always pick mad dog over noble, innocent baby people. Also, I'm really glad the camera stayed on Ramsey here. It's clearly a choice so that we don't have to watch this gruesome carnage that Ramsey so clearly loves watching. And personally, I don't think I could have handled seeing Walda and her baby eat all those dogs. Ramsey's power grab might seem reckless at first, but it's clear that the 
new Lord Karstark was in on it, and along with the Manderleys and the Umbers, potentially, he would have enough support to hold the North. So the teaser for the next episode showed that Lord Umber has a the gift for you. For Ramsay. I feel like that could be Rickon Stark, who was last seen headed to the Umbers with Osha. Um, I've been predicting that the Starks are going to bounce back this season, so I really am hoping that if it is Rickon, he's not like immediately killed. Maybe next week I'll talk about why Rickon's story is going to be a big letdown, but it will be a letdown on purpose. That sounds ridiculous, but I'll explain it in uh, next week's episode. And then after Sansa finds out that Arya is still alive, we get Theon and he says he intends to go home. Though, his home, another false sanctuary, buddy, is definitely not safe. We haven't seen old Balon Greyjoy in the Iron Islands since season three, but here he is at his home and it's a dangerous place. His death actually marks the official end of the War of the Five Kings. That's what Melisandre was doing way back when with all those leeches. She was asking for the deaths of the kings Joffrey, who's dead, Renly Baratheon, who's dead, Robb Stark, who's dead, and now Balon Greyjoy's dead. Unfortunately, the fifth king, Stannis, is also dead uh, and that's the one she was in support of so whoops maybe she like leached too hard or something anyway this marks a difference from the books because balon in the books he dies way earlier like right around the red wedding and when he dies it's just the storm that overtakes him like literally by himself that's it, it it's kind of lame actually there is a rumor in the books that it could have been a faceless man that showed up and like pushed him over but it's not confirmed it's kind of left at it just being the water and storm that kills him so i actually very much prefer the choice on the show of having his brother kill him it's more personal and interesting and and in a way, it still is the storm that kills him. I am the storm. This new character, by the way, in case you don't know, it's Euron Greyjoy. It's Balon's younger brother. He's a different brother from Aaron Greyjoy, who's Damp Hair, the drowned god priest who we'll see in a little bit. In the books, Euron is a cunning captain with an eye patch. It's one of the cooler characters, actually, in the series. Definitely one of the cooler characters of the Greyjoy story. And I know some of you couldn't follow the conversation that was happening and who this person was and what he was talking about. In fact, my buddy uh, TJ tweeted at me, what, what was the bridge scene? So here's what was going on there and here's what they were saying. Euron is a maniacal rogue captain with a huge ego and he considers himself the drowned god. I am the drowned god. Like not a worshiper of it, but the drowned god himself. And he went kind of crazy. Some people say because of a storm that scared him a lot and drove him mad. Other people say it's for different reasons. I heard you lost your mind. Tied you to the mast to keep you from jumping overboard. I did but he cuts out his entire crew's tongues to keep them from talking about how crazy he went. I needed silence. And now Euron is saying that he intends to replace his brother as king of the Iron Islands. Sorry if you're like, yeah, I knew all this, but uh, enough people were tweeting about confusion about what exactly happened there that I thought it was worth explaining. But also, trying to kill each other on a narrow rope bridge during a storm, it's not the warmest way for brothers to meet each other. And it just reminds me, like, I don't know which Greyjoy family family reunion was worse, this one, or when Theon reunited with Yara. You can tell your grandchildren about this night. I don't imagine it'll be a story fit for children. And that was gross. By the way, remember in the last episode breakdown how I mentioned that there was a family who really knows boats really well that could help replace Marine's burned up fleet? This is who I was talking about. Could these people come to Daenerys' aid? Maybe. I don't know. You tell me what you think. Uh, moving on. We see Aaron Damp Hair, which, uh, by the way, a lot of people pronounce it uh, differently. They say Damp Fear. George R. R. Martin admits that he probably should have put a hyphen in the name, but it is pronounced Damp Hair because his hair is always getting all damp. He's a priest of the drowned god. He's Balon's other brother who we saw baptize Theon in season two. And he tells Yara that the new king is gonna be chosen by a king's moot. The throne is not yours to swear upon. Not unless the king's moot chooses you. And you might not have paid attention to that moment, but that's actually kind of a big deal, a king's moot. So what is that? The king's moot is an ancient election ceremony in the Iron Islands that used to be the way the Ironborn chose a new king. But in recent years, the Greyjoy family has just ruled the island. But Damp Hair calls the king's moot because he doesn't see Balon having an obvious heir anymore. Euron's reputation is like super shady. Theon is still missing. And Yara is a woman, and that is still kind of an issue for them. So. 
they gotta go with the king's move, which involves captains of ships picking champions to vouch for them, and then they have to impress everyone with all the riches they've plundered. The other interesting thing about the king's moot, though, is it kind of makes the seat of the king just up for grabs for anyone. It really is just up to who can get the most support during the moot, which is basically the same idea as this open convention that a lot of people are talking about in, in real life here that they would want to use to prevent Donald Trump from becoming the Republican nominee. But that's not going to happen. This is kind of the closest that Westeros even gets to democracy. These open elections, they're one of the only good things to come out of the Iron Islands. That and very unconventional family reunions. And this whole part of the episode was a key reminder of the religion of the Ironborn. Their god is the drowned god, and their prayer is what is dead may never die, but rises again harder and stronger. Ironborn, right? Except they actually take that pretty literally. The Ironborn actually practice this form of resuscitation. They literally drown people in salt water and then bring them back to life because as they see it, if you died from drowning already, then you don't need to worry about dying anymore. So you're probably gonna become a badass warrior because you don't worry about death. Even though we know it's just like, oh, good thing somebody was good at CPR. But anyway, what's well, interesting that right after Damp Hair references warriors who come back from death, we go to Davos wondering if that can happen with Jon Snow. I assume you know why I'm here. And actually, Davos is kind of speaking for everybody watching the show when he talks to Melisandre and he's asking like, uh, could you just like, I mean, you, know, you have magic, right? Can't you just like, can you please use your magic and bring him back? And just like we saw last episode, Melisandre is totally bundled up next to the fire. The Lord of Light's warmth is totally gone from her. So she's hit this faith rock bottom. And specifically, the power of resurrection is something that she's always kind of weird about. If you remember back in season three, she was totally skeptical that that this drunk lowlife priest, Thoros of Mir, was able to bring back Beric Dondarrion, six times actually. But if you look back at that moment, Thoros talks about how he also was kind of at faith rock bottom when the Lord of Light let him perform his miracle. He admits that he was a drunk that didn't really believe in these words, and right then is when it actually works. So that could be a requirement to a red priest or priestess kind of being able to gain these powers. Also, by the way, speaking of a successful resurrection, check Check out the Christ imagery here with John's body. He's got the puncture wounds. He's got a white loincloth thing. And come on, I mean, he just looks like Jesus, right? This episode actually aired on Easter Sunday for Orthodox Christians, which is a day that celebrates Jesus's resurrection from the dead. That could be a coincidence, but I'm calling it. This is Jesus Snow. They're doing it on purpose. There's probably gonna be more Jesus stuff coming forward in the next couple episodes, I, I bet. People love doing that with resurrection storylines. See Glenn. <laughs> Melisandre even kind of acts like a Mary Magdalene figure who is famous for being the woman who cleans Jesus' feet. And she's also famous for how sad she got right before he was resurrected. In fact, the word maudlin comes from Mary Magdalene's sadness and tears over Jesus' death. But anyway, we just saw that from Melisandre too. A lot of parallels. Anyway, Melisandre then chants in Valyrian. And while we don't get any subtitles, my guess is that she's using the same words that Thoros said back when. It's a skewed version of the common Lord of Light prayer. And then lo and behold, Melisandre's rock bottom humble prayer does the trick. The camera lingers on John and bam, eyes open, snow's back baby. <laughs> Fun connection to point out here. This was the second episode of season six, and the second episode of season one ended with a parallel image where Bran Stark's eyes reopened from his sort of death coma thing. So Jon Snow's back from the dead, and thank God the show did it at least somewhat early in the season instead of waiting to the end, but uh, does this successful resurrection mean that the Lord of Light then is obviously the one true god? Not exactly, because we've seen all the other gods be magical in different ways too. The tree gods, allow Bran to see through time. The many-faced god can transform your face. The drowned god brings drowned men back to life, though it might just be like the Lord of CPR again. But assuming it really was the Lord of Light that brought back Jon Snow, then that probably does make Jon the prince who was promised that I talked about earlier, with the glowing sword being Lightbringer, Azor Ahai's sword that he uses. Azor Ahai is the prince that was promised, by the way. And if you don't know who Azor Ahai is, I'll just go to it really fast. Azor Ahai was an ancient warrior who used Lightbringer to fight off the nemesis 
nemesis of the Lord of Light, the Great Other. He's like the top White Walker of his time. Melisandre is obsessed with finding Azor Ahai's reborn version to fulfill the prophecy of him coming back to defeat the returning White Walkers. She used to think it was Stannis Baratheon, but he's dead. And meanwhile, uh, we saw Jon Snow obliterate a White Walker with his possible Lightbringer sword last season at Hardhome. And something interesting from the books, it goes a lot more into Melisandre and Jon Snow and Azor Ahai, but there's this chapter of A Dance with Dragons where Melisandre keeps thinking to herself about these prayers she's doing to see an image of Azor Ahai, and she talks about how the god only shows her snow. And then a few chapters later, Jon hears her say that all she keeps seeing in her visions is snow, and it kind of is purposely written away where you might think that it's like white snow and she's just not seeing anything. But one of the times in the book, they use a capital S when she says she sees the snow, so she obviously would mean that when she is looking for Azor Ahai in her vision, she sees Jon Snow. I'm gonna bring up more thoughts on Jon Snow in just a second, but let's talk about these closing images. Remember that the episode is titled Home. I've been talking a lot about the ideas of false sanctuaries, right? Where each of the major characters this episode realizing that the concept of home is not the safe haven that they thought it was. Tyrion informs us about how the home for the dragons is actually killing them. The three-eyed raven warns Bran that staying too long in what Bran calls home would drown Bran. Cersei is imprisoned inside the Red Keep, which is her home. Both Roose Bolton and Balon Greyjoy get murdered by family inside of the safety of their own homes, and Arya recognizes that the promise of home is a trick. But this is all counterintuitive, right? Shouldn't home be safe? Well, not in this world. And that's because of the actions that ordinary men have taken. Deceitful men, kind of like Jamie Lannister, Walder Frey, Alistair Thorne, they've all blatantly broken their vows, and broken their oaths, and done it all in the faces of the gods that they swore those oaths to. In the world of Game of Thrones, in the recent history of the show and the books, these people have begun taking sacred oaths and almost immediately spitting in the face of them. So for a really long time in Westeros, men kind of kept their word. They made their vows to gods and they honored them, and there was a respect for the laws that those gods established. Not anymore. The whole story actually started with this huge breaking of an oath, the one between a married man and woman. She swears to love and honor him. Littlefinger, though, convinced Lysa to poison Jon Arryn at the start of the series, poison her husband. That's just one of the many breakings of marriage oaths during this time period. Famously, yeah, the Red Wedding, but even before this whole story, Rhaegar forces the destruction of Lyanna and Robert's promised betrothal, and Cersei breaks her oath of marriage to Robert, which she conspires to have him killed, and also specifically about the Red Wedding, but before it, Rob breaks his oath to marry one of the Frey daughters. I was pledged to marry one of you, and I broke that vow. Which causes the Red Wedding in the first place, and going specifically into the Red Wedding, there's the other big oath that's broken there with the break the laws of hospitality. There are so many of these other oaths and vows that have been broken, in this period of Westeros include Thorne killing his Lord Commander, Alaria overthrowing her leader, Ramsay now kills his own kin. He's your brother. I prefer being an only child. Yada yada, I could go on forever, but basically, sacred oaths to the gods are being blatantly ignored and broken right now, and we can't expect the gods to just take that laying down. So that's what I meant by the gods have decided the reign of man is over. It's time to bring back the monsters and the magic of the gods. They're bringing back white walkers and dragons have come back from extinction and demon babies. It's kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, where these gods are like, these people are all jerks. Why don't we just like mow them all down and start over? Clean slate. Maybe the next generation of man, if there is one, will learn to stop breaking all of their freaking oaths. And by the way, the next episode's title is Oathbreaker. But if you're wondering, yeah, yeah basically everyone breaks oaths on the show. There's a couple of people, I guess, that don't. Yeah, those characters are important, the ones that don't. I think they're the ones that are finally being rewarded. And I think they're also the ones that happen to have been smart enough to leave their homes before those false sanctuaries could overtake them. Daenerys ran from the West as a baby and instead of returning to the home of the Targaryens, she continued to go east like the prophecy says she has to before she can go west. Jon Snow started the series pretty quickly choosing to leave his home for the Wall and even beyond that. And third, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but Tyrion is now a runaway from home, having also gone east. And before you say, wait, Tyrion did break a sacred oath. He killed his father. I'll remind you, there's a possibility that Tywin is not Tyrion's real father. So that oath is not really broken. 
So, our three heroes, they're some of the only honorable people in this world, and they're being smiled upon by the gods. They've not only lived up to their oaths that they've made to people, but they've used these opportunities in these journeys to learn more about what they need to do to become better people, and they've grown. And just as we're getting into the final act of our story, and every story is a version of the hero's journey, now our three heroes are changed for the better. So that means it's finally time for them to do what every good hero does, return home. Daenerys and Tyrion are going to go back to Westeros. Jon's going to go back to Winterfell. I'm guessing all of that. Oh, also really quick, if you listened to that theory about Tyrion earlier uh, that some people skipped, you also know the other big reason why those three people might be connected. Okay, so a few lingering questions. One, is this going to be the same Jon Snow? I don't expect him to be brain dead and mute like Khal Drogo and the Mountain after they were brought back to life, but Beric Dondarrion said that he loses a part of himself every time he's brought back. So how do we think we're Resurrection is going to affect John. My guess is his like view of the world is probably going to be pretty crappy right now. But do you have any other ideas of how John might be changed by his resurrection? Two, in the books, wargs are known for being transported into their animals when they die. But it's really hard to tell if that actually happened here with John. I know that you might not think John is a warg, but remember in the books, all the Starks are kind of wargs. So do you think John could have warged into ghosts? Last video, I broke down that the Starks family connection to their direwolves is very strong. And a lot of people think that Jon's consciousness maybe could have transferred over to Ghost the second that he died. But in the show, it seems kind of more like the Lord of Light just like jammed his soul back into his body, maybe unrelated to Ghost. Just wonder, do you think Ghost had any role in that resurrection? And three, if I'm right about Jon Snow, Daenerys Targaryen, and Tyrion Lannister all being currently smiled upon by the gods, then you could explain that Jon's resurrection is a miracle granted to him by the gods, and Daenerys being unburned by fire, that her ability to do that, is something she's been gifted by the gods. But then that would mean that Tyrion still might have a miracle coming his way. What do you think Tyrion's miracle could be? Let me know what you think about all of those in the comments. And also, if you haven't seen it already, check out our breakdown of last episode. I explained some of the Jon Snow theories there a little more clearly. If I miss something here, uh, it might be in that video, but also if there's anything else you want to point out or talk to me about, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, at Fimo. On Facebook, I have a little longer discussions usually. It's uh, facebook.com slash Fimo knows. And then if you want to know just about like like when videos come out, that kind of stuff, always uh, follow at New Rockstars on Twitter. If you like this video, please, you can hit the like button, but more importantly, I think you should share it with other people who like Game of Thrones. Also, subscribe to New Rockstars so you can keep up with all of these videos we do for Game of Thrones and everything else. So, that's it. Let's move the conversation to Twitter and Facebook. I'll catch you guys next week. See ya. Bye.